What is textual criticism and in particular what is New Testament textual criticism? In this series, we are going to talk about uh, the definition of textual criticism. We will talk about um, uh, the, the, the goals, how we're trying to accomplish the task, what it means to examine manuscripts, what kinds of manuscripts are out there, what languages they're in, what are the major textual problems of the New Testament, how certain we can be about what the text of the original New Testament really was, and we'll talk about a number of scholars. Uh, there's going to be all sorts of things that should be of value and interest to uh, many people who are interested uh, simply in the text of the New Testament. The definition of textual criticism historically has also been the goal of textual criticism. It is simply to try to ascertain the wording of the original text of a particular document when that original document no longer exists. Now, that goal has been nuanced in recent years, and there's been a second goal that some have wanted to make into the primary goal of textual criticism, but let me uh, address those issues. When it comes to New Testament textual criticism, the primary goal and the basic definition is to try to determine the wording of the original text of the New Testament because the original text no longer exists. If the original text of a document still existed, textual criticism would not be necessary. If all the copies of a document still exist, even though the original doesn't, and all those copies are exactly like each other, then textual criticism really would not be possible. So with New Testament textual criticism, our objective is to try to examine these copies to get back to that original wording. In recent years, textual criticism has been redefined, or at least New Testament textual criticism has been redefined. The goal used to be simply to try to recover the wording of the original text. But in recent years, the definition has become, let's find out what different scribes over the centuries have, ch how they've changed the text, and what those changes indicate about their socioeconomic, cultural uh, situation, their religious uh, background, their polit politics, this kind of thing. Now, that should not be the primary goal of textual criticism, but it has a very important role in the process of understanding the transmission of the text. And it also is a goal that should tell us if I can find out what influence to scribe to change the wording to X from Y, then that tells me that X is not the original reading, but it came from Y. Now, in terms of the definition that uh, most textual critics follow of trying to determine the wording of the original text, there has also been, in recent years, uh, an, a new wrestling with how we define the term original. And there have been some issues that we need to think about. One of these issues is, is an original text the text that an author uh, initially wrote, but may have then fine-tuned it later on? Which one of those counts as the original text? That's a great question. When Shakespeare did his plays at the Globe in London, for example, he would fine-tune them, he would tweak them, the wording would change from play to play. Uh, when Mozart was doing his uh, concerts and his operas uh, in uh, uh, Vienna, then he would also be taking it through various changes. The fact is that if scholars were to find duplicate copies or more than one handwritten copy of uh, Shakespeare's plays or Mozart's operas, which one would be considered the original? It's, it's, a, it's a difficult question. It's a tough question. So one scholar raised these illustrations and said the New Testament seems to be the sort of a document that is not capable of being able to define what the original text is. Another scholar pointed out that we need to have uh, different ideas of what an original text is. And what he ultimately landed on, I think, as the best definition, although I'm not so sure he felt it was the best definition, was the what's called what the Germans call the Ausgangstext. That means it's the text that exited from the author as it was dispatched to the readers. And uh, this is also sometimes known as the autographic text or the autographs. I think that's the best definition of an original text when it comes to the New Testament documents. And so the issue here is this. When an author writes something, and then sends it to readers who are in a different location, as soon as it leaves that author's hands, now we're dealing with that document which is finalized as far as he's concerned, and consequently that's what we would call the original text, or uh, more exactly the autographic or Ausgangstext. We'll use those terms interchangeably in this uh, introduction to textual criticism, however, 
And that's the text that we are talking about. When we say original, it's what leaves the author's hands when it's dispatched to the readers in some other region. Textual criticism is necessary for the New Testament documents, just as it is necessary for virtually every scrap of ancient uh, Greco-Roman literature for two reasons. First of all, we don't have the autographic or the original text anymore. And secondly, no two manuscripts agree completely. Well, the reason no two manuscripts agree completely is because all these manuscripts, by definition, were written by hand. There was no movable type printing press until the year 1454, when Johann Gutenberg in the city of Mainz, Germany, actually invented the, uh, the machine that could do this, and it uh, was one of the greatest invention, uh, one of the greatest inventions of the last millennium. Uh, it happened a year after the Turks invaded Byzantium on May 29th, 1453, which will become a significant point for us as we think through some of the issues of the transmission of the New Testament as well. So within a, a, a two-year period, 1953-1954, two very significant events took place that affect uh, New Testament textual criticism. But as I was saying, up until that time, we didn't have manuscripts printed on a printing press. They were all handwritten. And because they were all handwritten, every single one of them has mistakes in it. Now, most of the changes that these manuscripts have are very, very trivial. Spelling differences, for example, are among the most common, and largely because there was no standardized spelling of so many words in the ancient world. As a matter of fact, what's fascinating is, in, it, within the space of eight verses in one chapter, in the Gospel of John, the author spells the exact same word. It's a, for those of you who know Greek, it's a third person singular, aorist active indicative of anoigo. The word means I open. He spells it three different ways in, within the space of eight verses. Now that's remarkable that we could have that kind of variety of spelling, but there weren't dictionaries that said there's a right way to spell, there's a wrong way to spell these words. When it comes to the New Testament manuscripts, not only are no two uh, manuscripts exactly alike, but th as you look at the earlier documents, two of the closest manuscripts of the ancient world, when we're talking about first millennium, even we're talking about the first half millennium, the first 500 years AD, now we're talking about manuscripts that differ, even those that are as close to each other as we can find, between six and ten times per chapter. Well, there's about 250 chapters for the whole New Testament, so if those manuscripts were complete New Testaments, we're talking about a couple thousand differences for those documents for the spread of the New Testament. Because we don't have the autographs anymore, because the manuscripts differ from each other, and because they differ at times quite a bit, at other times it's still minimally six to ten times per chapter of the early and important witnesses, we have to practice the discipline of textual criticism to try to get back to the original. Ultimately, the objective, as we examine all these manuscripts and think about the data, is to try to sift through and find out what kinds of variants or textual changes were created either accidentally or created intentionally as a change to some other form of the text than what the authors originally wrote. And we'll wrestle with those issues as we get into uh, this discipline a little bit more. When we come to the text of the New Testament and try to determine what the autographs are actually about, one of the great problems we have is the amount of material that we have to look at. Now, I'm going to compare this material to what other ancient Greco-Roman literature looks like in terms of their uh, material remains of these various authors. And that's why I've uh, entitled this uh, lesson, An Embarrassment of Riches. So if we take, for example, three Roman historians from the first century approximately AD, uh, on whom we're basing most of our understanding of what ancient Rome was like, We've got Livy, Suetonius, and Tacitus. Now, Livy, we are waiting 300 years before we see any copies of his writings, and we don't see the full array of what he wrote about Roman history. Most of it's simply lost forever without any knowledge of where it went to. We have a grand total of about 30 copies of Livy in existence today that we can examine to try to see what he had to say. Another ancient Roman historian uh, was known as Tacitus. And we are waiting 
for 800 years before we see any copies of Tacitus's works. And the grand total that we have are three. Three copies of Tacitus, and yet he's one of the great Roman historians to give us the information that we need on the, the history of Rome in and around uh, the first century AD as well as uh, before that time. A third author, Suetonius, we have quite a bit of material from Suetonius. We have over 200 manuscripts from Suetonius. But again, like Tacitus, we are waiting 800 years before we get any copies of his writings. Now, if we were to compare this to the New Testament documents, you would see that we have an embarrassment of riches. And it truly is an embarrassment for New Testament scholars, which creates kind of an existential crisis of how do we approach this material? What can we safely disregard, at least to some extent, as we examine the more important materials? Here's the data. We have, for our New Testament manuscripts, at, at the present time, close to 5,800 copies of these manuscripts in Greek alone. Now, if you were to wipe out all of the Greek manuscripts, this is what the text of the New Testament was originally written in, Greek. If you were to wipe out all of those, we could still reproduce the text of the New Testament many, many times over from the witnesses that we have in Latin, which were uh, as early as the second century. And the Latin text, we have over 10,000 copies of Latin manuscripts of the New Testament in existence today. Uh, we could reproduce the text in Latin and Coptic. Coptic is an ancient uh, Egyptian language. It's essentially Egyptian hieroglyphics that are put into Greek letters. And uh, that, the Coptic text starts as early as the third century. We have hundreds of Coptic uh, manuscripts today. In fact, we have probably at least 1,500 Coptic manuscripts, if not quite a few more, that have not yet been cataloged. Uh, all around the world, there's many, many Coptic New Testament manuscripts that are simply not yet cataloged and therefore not known to New Testament scholars. Besides Coptic, we also have Syriac, another very, very important ancient uh, copy of the New Testament, and we have hundreds of copies of Syriac. Then the New Testament was translated into many other languages. It was translated into Georgian, into Gothic, into Arabic. It was translated into Old Church Slavonic, into Anglo-Saxon and Armenian. We have so many copies of the New Testament in all these versions that there are surely between 15,000 and 20,000 copies of the New Testament, not in Greek, written on handwritten manuscripts. So it's, it's, a, it's an embarrassment of riches. Then you add to that the over 5,000 copies of the New Testament in Greek, and we've got uh, over 20,000 copies, well over 20,000 copies most likely, of the New Testament in various languages before the time of the printing press. Now I should mention uh, something that is true both for the New Testament and for these other ancient authors, and that is this. A copy of one of these ancient documents does not mean that it's a complete copy. We have our earliest manuscripts for the New Testament as well as the earliest manuscripts for Livy and for Suetonius and Tacitus are going to be those that are fragmentary texts. The earlier you go, the less likely it is that you're going to have a complete copy. In fact, the oldest complete New Testament manuscript that we have in existence, which happens to be in Greek, and it happens to be an exceedingly important manuscript, is Codex Sinaiticus, which is housed now at the British Library in London. It's written in about the middle of the 4th century, somewhere around AD 350, give or take 25 years, and it's a complete New Testament. That's our oldest complete New Testament. However, we also have a number of manuscripts that, although fragmentary, have quite a bit of text up to that point. Now, I've mentioned the number of copies we have for the New Testament, and that gives us an embarrassment of riches. But I haven't talked to you about the dates. As you recall, with Livy, Suetonius, and Tacitus, we're dealing with the earliest manuscripts coming 300 years, and those are only of Livy. And then uh, Suetonius and Tacitus, we're waiting 800 years before we get copies. These are fairly representative for ancient Greco-Roman authors. Uh, the, the, the best among them is going to be Homer, and of course Homer has an 800 year head start over uh, first century authors, so uh, he's got quite a few more copies than these other authors do, but not more copies than in the New Testament. Uh, Homer's in a, a league by itself, but I, I'll just summarize this and say that we have approximately 1,000% as many copies of the New Testament in its various languages as we do copies of Homer. It's a remarkable difference, and he is in second place in terms of literary remains among all Greco-Roman literature. Huge disparity. 
Now, in terms of the date of these New Testament manuscripts, the earliest come from the second century, from within 100 years of the completion of the New Testament. Scholars have pointed to a fragment of John's Gospel known as P52, or Papyrus Number 52, that is housed at Manchester University in the John Rylands Library today. Manchester University in central England had a scholar who was uh, resting with the data in the, the library back in 1934, and he was a, a bona fide papyrologist. His name was Colin H. Roberts. He found this fragment in uh, the John Rylands Library, and he said, this looks like it's um, from the New Testament. I mean, he, he was a papyrologist, so he's dealing with other kinds of texts, and looking for a New Testament manuscript among the papyri is like looking for the proverbial needle in a haystack. About one-tenth of one percent of all published papyri are actually uh, New Testament manuscripts, so it's, it's pretty hard to find them. But uh, he discovered this quite by accident and said, I think this is from the New Testament. Sure enough, it was. On one side of this papyrus leaf was John chapter 18, verses 31 through 33, and on the other side was John 18, verses 37 and 38. And so a year later, Roberts published this papyrus, P52. It got published in 1935, but he had circulated photographs of it to the three leading papyrologists of Europe at the time, and each one independently wrote back to him and said, we believe that this manuscript should be dated no later than, a, than A.D. 150 and as early as A.D. 100. A fourth one wrote back and said, I think that this manuscript is probably written in the last decade of the first century, so in the 90s. That was a remarkable discovery, and it really changed an awful lot of ways in how biblical scholars have looked at when John's gospel was written. One wag even said, well, the ink of John's Gospel must have been barely dry when P52 was copied from it. And so uh, the idea was that John's Gospel was very, very late middle of the second century, something like that. Well, since that time, a number of other manuscripts have been discovered. This is one that has just what, half a dozen verses, and it's only the size of the palm of my hand. But um, uh, other manuscripts have also been discovered that uh, are apparently from the second century. The scholars have debated in more recent years what the date of P52 is. We're not exactly sure because it doesn't say this was written at this time, and so we've got to make comparisons of this manuscript with other manuscripts whose dates are known, and they're known because they're non-literary papyri where someone says, dear so-and-so, and he writes it in the year of uh, uh, the reign of Augustus, uh, his 14th year, or something like that. So we can pinpoint the date in time when we do that kind of thing. But there are other manuscripts from the second century as well. Uh, papyrus number 66, which is at the Bodmer Museum in Cologne, Switzerland, on the shores of Lake Geneva, is a remarkable manuscript that has most of John's gospel in it. It doesn't have the entirety of John anymore. The outside leaves have fallen off and uh, from chapters 14 on. It's, it's fairly fragmentary. But P66 is a manuscript that was dated somewhere between A.D. 150 and A.D. 200, and yet it's got most of John's Gospel in it. Really a remarkable text. We also have uh, several other manuscripts, P4, P64, P67. We've got others that are possibly second century, what's known as P75, which is a document that has both Luke and John in it, the, the vast majority of those verses. P46 is the earliest document we have of Paul's letters. It's housed now at the Chester Beatty Museum in Dublin, Ireland, and at least most of it is. The rest of it is housed at the University of Michigan. This manuscript is dated at about A.D. 200, so right on the cusp between the 2nd century and the 3rd century, and it has today most of Paul's letters in it. Uh, we know that it had uh, 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 far more material than it has now, although we still have the majority of what it has today. The reason is because the scribe actually wrote out what the page number was, and so we can see some of the later pages and figure out exactly how much uh, this text would have had in it. Uh, these are some of our early manuscripts. Altogether, we have manuscripts from the second century or possibly the second or third century that number as many as 10 or 12 manuscripts that are dated to about that time period. Now, in terms of how much material of the New Testament they have, the remarkable thing is that approximately 43% of all the verses of the New Testament, 
not the entirety of each verse, but 43% of parts of those verses, and in most instances, the majority of those verses, are found in these manuscripts that are dated to the second century or to the second slash third century. That's a, an amazing amount of material very early on for the New Testament. Then you get into the third century, and we have uh, quite a few more manuscripts. In the fourth century, basically, when, by the time we get to within 300 years of the completion of the New Testament, we have well over 100 manuscripts. In Greek alone, not counting the, the other ancient uh, languages, the other ancient versions, that have the text of the New Testament, including our first complete Greek New Testament manuscript that has every book of the New Testament. The entire New Testament is duplicated many times over in these manuscripts that we have through the first 300 years after the completion of the New Testament. There's nothing in the ancient world that comes close to that in terms of the completion of material and the date of the material. We just don't have any parallels at all that even stand a chance against the materials we have for the New Testament. So what scholars have to deal with is this embarrassment of riches of massive amounts of material. And on the other hand, they have to deal with the early texts, and yet those early manuscripts very frequently uh, differ from each other. They typically differ from each other more than the later manuscripts do that were almost cranked out, uh, not by a printing press, but very, very uh, carefully produced, but on a, on a standard text that was uh, changed significantly from the early text. So we've been talking about this embarrassment of riches. How much do we have of the average ancient uh, Greek author, Greek or Latin author, how much do we have of his literary remains? The average author has fewer than, and I'm giving a very liberal estimate here, fewer than 20 copies of his uh, literary remains still in existence. And most uh, of these uh, Greco-Roman authors would have just a handful, one, two, three, maybe six or seven copies, that's it. So uh, giving a generous estimate of 20 copies, if you were to stack those literary remains up, how tall would it be? Well, on average, it would end up being about four feet high. If we had 20 copies of their, the remains, you'd get up to four feet high. Now, take the New Testament manuscripts in the Greek and all the ancient versions, how high would that stack be? That would be closer to about a mile high. It's a huge difference between these ancient Greco-Roman authors and their literary remains and what we have for the New Testament. Now, if you were to wipe out all of the Greek manuscripts and all of the ancient versions of the New Testament, would we be left without a witness? Not at all. We also have the fathers of the church or ancient bishops and presbyters and elders and deacons who wrote commentaries and homilies on the New Testament. Beginning in the late first century, we start getting these church fathers who are making some minor comments on the New Testament as it was in a state of, of uh, production. It wasn't really yet regarded as the New Testament until uh, it became what's called canonized. That is when uh, the church recognized certain books and determined that certain books would be considered scripture, which didn't, it, it took some time for that to happen. But in the meantime, these patristic writers in the late first century, second century, third century, all the way up through typically the 13th century is how we count them, uh, are quoting from the New Testament and alluding to the New Testament. How much material do we have from the church fathers uh, in terms of quotations and allusions from the New Testament? Well, the best estimate is that we have well over one million quotations of the New Testament by the church fathers for this uh, period of time. That's a, a huge amount of resources, and the entire New Testament is reproduced again many times over in the writings of these church fathers. Finally, when you think in terms of the amount of material, there's another way to quantify this. Altogether, among our Greek manuscripts only, we have approximately two and a half million pages of manuscripts of the Greek New Testament, which the Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts is dedicated to digitizing as much as we are allowed to and as much as we are able to. Those two and a half million pages uh, average out to about 500 pages per manuscript. So the average Greek New Testament manuscript is about 500 pages long. This is a, a significant amount of material. We're not dealing primarily with fragments, but with some lengthy materials, and very early on we get this.
When you compare the New Testament to the other ancient Greco-Roman literature, the remarkable thing is the average other Greco-Roman literature, the average uh, author from Greece or from Rome, has no literary remains for at least 300 years, while as the New Testament has well over 100 copies in Greek alone within the first 300 years of the completion of the New Testament. As we mentioned in the last uh, lecture, there are two aspects to the nature of doing textual criticism. There's the external evidence and there's internal evidence. External evidence looks at the material data that we actually have to try to uh, get back to the wording of the autographic or original text. Internal evidence looks at what we think an author would be likely to do and what we think a scribe would be likely to do. Now, those are the two aspects of internal evidence. One is called intrinsic probability, what the author is likely to do. The other is called transcriptional probability, what the scribe is likely to do. The problem you've got is that there's a number of people, as soon as they hear these differences, they, they say, well, that's totally subjective. How do you know what the author would be likely to do? How do you know what the scribe would be likely to do? It is true that it's subjective but it is not totally subjective, just as the examination of the material evidence, the external evidence, is not totally objective either. The reason it's not is because every single manuscript we have of any material uh, length has corruptions in it. There is no perfect manuscript. Consequently, we have to look at these manuscripts as corrupt documents, but relatively corrupt. Some are better than others, and we have to look at internal evidence as subjective, but relatively subjective. Some of the criteria are stronger in giving us a very good sense of what the earlier reading or the authentic reading would have been in light of a number of data. Now, when we look at these two aspects, we combine the external and the internal evidence together to come up with a hypothesis in the general guideline that textual critics to de use to determine what the original text said is this. Choose the reading or the textual variant which best explains the rise of the others. If you have reading A that can best explain what reading B and reading C have to say, that is you can see that I think reading B comes from reading A and I can see how reading C would come from reading A or possibly from reading B. Then you have a good sense of what we're dealing with here. Let me give uh, one example. I'll be giving several examples through this uh, uh, lecture series, but here's an example from Romans chapter 8 verse 1. We read in certain manuscripts, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Other manuscripts have more material here, and they say there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh. And so they add a phrase which looks very much like a qualifier. The first statement is, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. The second statement is, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ who do not walk according to the flesh. Then another group of manuscripts, the majority of our manuscripts, but also the later manuscripts, add yet another qualifying phrase, but who do walk according to the Spirit. When we combine both the external and internal evidence on this particular problem, what we discover is that our earliest manuscripts, which have solid date and character, and they have pretty good genealogical solidarity and helpful geographical distribution, they seem to point in the direction that the shortest reading that is, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, goes back to the autographic text. When we look at that in combination with the internal evidence and ask the questions, what would the author be likely to have written? What would the scribes be likely to have written? Then that combination tells us that most likely that shorter reading is in fact what the Apostle Paul wrote. Now, let me explain how the internal evidence plays into this. We know throughout church history that qualifications were added on top of what uh, salvation seemed to be about in, uh, in uh, Paul's teachings. And consequently, it would be a likely thing for a scribe to want to add a qualification for Paul's unqualified absolute statement, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 
scribes would feel uncomfortable with this. And so they added a qualifier that we actually do see later in verse 4 of Romans chapter 8, but it seems to be in a slightly different context. And so they added the line, for those who walk, do not walk according to the flesh. But then a later group of scribes said, well, that's not enough. We need to also add another qualifier, make a positive statement, but who walk according to the Spirit. So then you get the fullest statement, which we find in the King James Bible, which ironically enough, even though it's the earliest uh, translation of the, of the New Testament into English by uh, a large committee, and uh, it, it uh, beat out the Geneva Bible, which was done in 1560, the 1611 King James Bible, was one that was done by a much larger committee and it was actually done in England and it's had a long and uh, a very uh, significant history. Uh, that is based on later manuscripts, no earlier than about the 12th century. So it's based on manuscripts about 500 years younger than itself. While modern translations are based on manuscripts that go in many cases all the way back to the second century. So our modern translations are based on uh, manuscripts that have a date that precedes the time of the manuscripts behind the King James New Testament by a thousand years in many cases. And we have approximately 1,000 times as many Greek manuscripts at our disposal as the King James translators used for doing their New Testament. Now, back to the internal evidence in all this. When you ask the question, what is the author likely to have written? How can we determine that? That's called intrinsic probability. Well, we can see from places where the text is very stable what an author's style is. Does he speak this way or does he speak that way? For example, in John's Gospel, we know that John does not like to call Jesus Lord until after his resurrection in the narratives. And consequently, when we look at John 4.1, there's a textual problem there. When Jesus knew that the Pharisees had heard that he was making and baptizing more disciples than John, is what John 4, 1 says, or other manuscripts, when the Lord knew that he was making and baptizing more disciples than John. And so it's when Jesus knew or when the Lord knew. Now, frankly, in terms of the significance of the meaning, there's not a whole lot of, of uh, consequence uh, in this particular textual problem. But in terms of John's style, there does seem to be a very clear and distinct way in which he writes for the times in which he narrates about who Jesus is before his resurrection. He calls him Jesus and other terms, but he doesn't typically use Lord. After the resurrection, that's when he begins to use the word Lord far more frequently. Here in John 4, 1, we have a scribe who changes Jesus to Lord, and uh, then you've got other scribes who fit. Well, yes, of course, that's the appropriate term to, to describe him by. And here again, we see the majority of manuscripts that have the word Lord, while the early manuscripts, uh, many of them have the word Jesus here. So we ask the question, what would an author be likely to do? Style is a factor involved in that. Does John usually use this word or this word to describe Jesus before his resurrection? So those are very important issues. And, and some of these uh, textual problems are very famous problems that scholars have literally logged thousands of hours to try to determine. Uh, there are whole doctoral dissertations on which a PhD is granted that deal with one word in the Greek New Testament to determine is this authentic or is this not authentic. And they go through all of the evidence of external evidence and, and uh, internal evidence to try to determine what uh, that word uh, uh, really was that the author wrote. So intrinsic evidence has to do with what would the author be likely to have written, and a part of that has to do with his style. Another part of it has to do with the context, both the immediate context and the broader context of what he's dealing with. And then there's the narrative art and other things that would bring into bear on, uh, on those uh, features as we're examining what an author would have written. When you take uh, into consideration, uh, for example, the story of the woman caught in adultery, which is John chapter 7, verse 53 through John 8, 11. Now we see that the earliest manuscripts, in fact, most of the manuscripts of the first millennium do not have this story. This is a passage, these 12 verses, I would say are my favorite passage that's not in the Bible. Uh, I used to be adamant that this text was part of the original text of John's gospel. But uh, over the years, I've, uh, as I've studied this, I've recognized what the vast majority of New Testament textual critics already have recognized, 
that most likely it was later scribes who add this text to John's Gospel. It ends up in several different places in John. It ends up in three different places in John chapter 7. It ends up at the end of John's Gospel, or at the end of all four Gospels. It ends up after Luke chapter 21, verse 38. It ends up just as a tack on to all the Gospels without being placed any one place by some manuscripts. Here's a floating text that goes uh, in a number of different directions. But in terms of the intrinsic evidence, when you begin to examine this in terms of idioms and vocabulary, you don't have nearly the same vocabulary frequency in the story of the woman caught in adultery as you do in other parts of John. In other words, here's a text that as you're reading through this, if you were to read through it in your Greek text, and you come to John 7:53 through 8:11, it all of a sudden strikes the average reader that there's something different here. This doesn't sound like the John that I've been reading all along. And after you get done with back, done with 8:11, then you go on and you say, "Oh, now this sounds like the author that I've been reading all along." This is a text that was trying to get into the canon, if you will, or trying to get into Scripture, and in many respects it was successful because when the King James Bible was published, it had the story of the woman caught in adultery in it, and since that date there has been what we might call a tradition of timidity that has kept that in the text, even though the vast majority of scholars who have produced Bible translations in the, in the 20th and 21st century would say, we don't believe that these 12 verses are part of what John originally wrote. That doesn't mean that they're not historically true. That's a different question from whether they are literarily a part of the fourth gospel. But the intrinsic evidence shows us once again, the vocabulary, the idioms, the syntax, the style, and the context don't seem to match with the rest of John's Gospel very well, so it doesn't look like it's authored by the, uh, the evangelist. The second aspect of internal evidence is transcriptional probability, and this has to do with what a scribe would be likely to have written. Now, that sounds subjective right off the bat, but again, what we're looking at is predictable variants that we can see that scribes would do if they're unrelated to each other, and there's a number of kinds of variants that are very obvious. For example, when we look at the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, these are gospels that are called synoptic because they look at the life of Jesus from pretty much the same perspective or the same eye, the same viewpoint almost, uh, which is what synoptic has to do with. And uh, John, meanwhile, is way out there and uh, taking a different look at Jesus from a different perspective entirely. But the synoptic gospels have a number of parallels. 90% of Mark's Gospel is found in Matthew's Gospel, for example. And so obviously Matthew has, in essence, cannibalized what we have in Mark and put it into his Gospel and then he's uh, tweaked it and changed it for his particular purposes. Now there's times where the wording just doesn't match up, many times where the wording just doesn't match up between uh, two of these Gospels or three of these Gospels. When a scribe comes along uh, and sees that, what does he do? Well, the natural tendency would be to harmonize these texts so they say exactly the same thing. And so the scribal tendency is to, Matthew says this, Mark says this, let's make them say the exact same thing. We're not talking necessarily about discrepancies in the text here. We are talking about differences, though, and differences that sometimes don't seem to make a whole lot of uh, difference in the meaning, but they have to do with a different perspective, a different emphasis, things along those lines. And so the scribes have a natural tendency to harmonize two different Gospels so that they're saying the same words. Consequently, that's what we would call, in terms of transcriptional probability, an intentional change to the text. Although the intentional change is not that the scribe in the 5th or 6th century is coming across this and he sees Matthew say X and he sees Mark say Y. He's not uh, thinking, you know, um, I, uh, I know that uh, I'm going to be messing with Mark's gospel to make it say X just like Matthew does, and I'm changing it from what the original text said, but I'm going to do this anyway because I want to harmonize. That's not what they're thinking. They're generally speaking thinking, these two manuscripts or these two gospels say something different here, and I already know that the scribe who read out the copy of the gospels that I'm looking at has made numerous mistakes. I just bet he made another mistake here, and so I'm going to change the wording of Mark to conform it to what Matthew has to say. That's a known scribal tendency to harmonize the gospels, and so when we see more than one manuscript doing that and doing it in the same direction, if it's a predictable variant, there's not necessarily any 
geographical distribution that suggests that these two are linked going back to an earlier ancestor. It's just a predictable variant that could have arisen quite independently in two different parts of the empire without having any influence from the other. So that's intentional changes, and that's just one example of them as harmonizations. Scribes also made unintentional changes, and these could be due to uh, bad eyesight where they write down the wrong letters or the wrong words. It could be due to the fact that they may not know Greek very well. And so they're copying out maybe a few letters at a time, but they make a number of mistakes as they're copying out, uh, out the text. This is the kind of an error that scholars can determine with great facility as to this scribe made this mistake. There are two manuscripts from the 9th century, for example, Codex F and Codex G of Paul's letters that uh, one is housed in Dresden in Germany and the other one is at Trinity College in Cambridge, England. And these two manuscripts agree with each other in spelling differences from all the rest of the manuscripts out there that at times seem to be bizarre spellings. These two manuscripts are both diglots, that is they have another language in there and in each manuscript it's Latin. In one of them it's interleaved, that is you've got uh, Greek on one page and Latin on the other. The other one, it's uh, interlinear, so you've got uh, Greek on one line and Latin on the other. But they have so many commonalities in not just defective spelling, although there was no standard for spelling really, uh, but their spelling differences are so different from any other manuscripts that they surely must be cousins, if not sisters, uh, of each other in, in copying the exact same uh, ancestor. And so we can look at those kinds of things. Those are not predictable variants. Those are accidental changes. These two scribes must be related to each other as, as far as we can tell because of uh, the kinds of changes that they have that nobody else agrees with. Now, other kinds of changes that are uh, accidental, and this is all under the, the uh, rubric of transcriptional probability, would be changes due to bad hearing, where someone doesn't hear exactly what the lecturer is reading and so he doesn't copy out the words exactly the same. Bad eyesight, where it's not necessarily bad eyesight, but it's rather that you see one line, and then you see another line that ends with the same words, and you actually copy out that second line, skipping the first one, where you may have skipped an entire line of text. This is known as haplography, or writing out once what should have been written twice. Other times you write out one line, and then you see the next line that, that uh, uh, looks similar to it, and then you write the first line again, and so you're writing the same thing out twice when it should have been written once. That's called dittography. So we've got these uh, accidental changes as well as intentional changes. All of this comprises what's called transcriptional probability. So putting this together, you've got for internal evidence two aspects, intrinsic probability, what an author would be likely to have written, and transcriptional probability, what a scribe would be likely to have written. And putting those two together, when they say the same thing, when they say, you know, this is most likely what the scribe wrote, this most likely is what the author would have written, and they agree with each other, then we have a pretty high probability on the basis of internal evidence as to what the biblical text originally said. Textual criticism, in terms of how it is practiced, is divided into two broad sections. One is known as external evidence and the other is internal evidence. External evidence has to do with an examination of the data that are out there, the hard data, the manuscripts, the versions, and the, and the father's writings. Internal evidence has to do with what you might call the soft data, which has to do with what an author would likely uh, have written and what would the scribes be likely to have done. Although both of those are of virtually equal importance, they do come at the, the problem of the text in different ways, and we need to combine their efforts to see how we uh, view a particular textual variant in terms of whether it's authentic or not. When it comes to external evidence, it has three components. One is the date and character of the manuscripts. The second is known as genealogical solidarity, and the third is known as geographical distribution. Date and character has to do with an examination of each individual manuscript in terms of when it was written and in terms of how good of a witness it is to its own group of manuscripts within, it, within which it exists. 
Now that group of manuscripts sometimes is known as text types, others call them families, and there's other scholars that are moving away from this kind of terminology altogether. But nevertheless, when we look at a, a manuscript, one of the considerations that we have is what is the date of the manuscript? And generally speaking, we would say that the earlier the manuscript, the more likely it is to go back to the original wording of the text. So date is an important factor. Coupled with this is the character of the manuscript. Is this manuscript a good representative of the textual family to which it belongs? And we can check that out by comparing it with some of these other manuscripts that belong to that textual family. Obviously, if a manuscript is both early and is considered to be a good witness to that textual family, then we'd say that that is an important manuscript. Now, some manuscripts don't naturally yield themselves into a particular uh, family of manuscripts at all, but they are still early and it's hard to pigeonhole them as to where they belong, but they are significant manuscripts in their own right because of their date. Codex Washingtoniensis in uh, Washington, D.C. is one of these manuscripts, a late 4th, perhaps early 5th century manuscript, as some have dated it. S other scholars have dated it much later to the 7th century, and a couple of scholars have dated it uh, significantly earlier than 4th or 5th century. But it's a manuscript that doesn't quite naturally fit into any one of these textual families, but it, because of its uh, most likely early date, it has some significance all on its own. Now, so the date and character is an important thing. Now, one of the considerations we have to look at on this is just because a manuscript is early does not necessarily mean that it's going to be an important witness to the text of the New Testament. For example, a scribe may have been uh, sloppy in his copying practices. He may have been copying, say, three or four words at a time instead of a couple of letters at a time. We know, for example, that the scribe of P66, a late second century document, was one who was far more interested in calligraphy, in making pretty letters on his manuscript, than he was in accurately transmitting the text that was in front of him. Meanwhile, another scribe, the scribe of P75, which is probably an early third century, possibly a late second century manuscript. There the scribe looks as if he's making a personal copy. Uh, the manuscript is not nearly as clean as P66. It looks almost kind of like chicken scratches. But this scribe is very careful to write out the exemplar in front of him. And consequently, he's writing one or two letters at most at a time. And so the kinds of mistakes he makes are those that are typically nonsense errors and transpositions where he inverts one letter in the place of the other. So instead of spelling cat, C-A-T, he might have spelled it C-T-A. And uh, consequently, those are the kinds of mistakes we have. So date and character is important, but again, an early manuscript where the scribe is not careful, uh, as, and especially if he knows Greek well and intentionally changes the text, is not going to be as valuable as a scribe who is careful or who makes the kinds of mistakes that are easily detectable. Generally speaking, those kinds of mistakes that end up with nonsense readings are to be preferred to the ones that make sense because it's, it's easier to see, oh, this scribe meant to write X instead of Y. When a scribe is intentionally changing the text, it's very difficult to tell what uh, the manuscript in front of him actually said. Now, there are some manuscripts that come further down the line that are every bit as valuable as the early manuscripts. And this is where the date of a manuscript does not become nearly as important. The classic example is Codex 1739, a manuscript that is of medieval age, and it's on the peninsula of Mount Athos in northeastern Greece, where 22 monasteries are located. No woman has legally set foot on this peninsula for a millennium. Codex 1739 is a document that is extremely significant because here the scribe, Ephraim was his name, was uh, a scribe who uh, tried to find the earliest possible manuscript he could to copy from. And we have evidence of some of his other writings. Uh, Codex 1582 is another one that he wrote out, and he wrote out some classical texts as well. He was very careful to find the earliest and the best copies he could. And the ancestor that he apparently directly copied from in the 10th century was a manuscript that comes from the late 4th or early 5th century. So there's no intervening copies between what uh, this scribe wrote and what his ancestor says. 
So Codex 1739 becomes a manuscript that we would consider to be as important as a late 4th or early 5th century manuscript of the Greek New Testament. Very important. But that's the exception that proves the rule. Normally, the earlier the date, the more important the manuscript. Now, when it comes to the character of the manuscripts, again, we say that the better a witness is to the textual family that it belongs to, uh, this gives it good character. This is important for us to consider. One of the things we can determine about these manuscripts is uh, through a number of processes, we can pretty much determine how a scribe copied out his or her text, whether it was word for word, letter for letter, or large phrase for large phrase, and some of them uh, copied out the text by sense phrases, this kind of a thing. Uh, but uh, the character of the manuscript is based both on the fact that we're dealing with a manuscript that is a good witness to its textual family and the way in which it copied its exemplar was one in which it did not get too creative and go off in some different directions, but may have made nonsense errors or minor changes from what that exemplar's text said. In other words, the scribe was a faithful scribe trying to copy what uh, uh, the manuscript in front of it actually was saying. The second area of external evidence is known as genealogical solidarity. If the best witnesses of a particular text form agree with each other on the reading or the textual variant, then we would say that there is a pretty decent genealogical solidarity. By genealogical, what we mean is, uh, if you think in terms of the, a family genealogy, those members that are close to each other, that have the same parents, the same grandparents, and they all have blue eyes and blonde hair, we'd say these folks seem to have a pretty strong resemblance because of their ancestry. When you're looking at genealogy of manuscripts, when you see a strong resemblance because of their ancestry, and especially if you see it in the manuscripts that are otherwise determined to be uh, both early and uh, significant and uh, good witnesses in terms of their character, we'd say that now we have genealogical solidarity. And the point of the external evidence, the point of all these different st uh, steps in textual criticism, in fact, is to try to get back to the earlier reading, namely the autographic text. We have to do so without material evidence to get there. So if I'm looking at, say, 10 manuscripts from the fourth century, if we had that many all reading the same text, uh, that belong to the same family, and nine of them all say, uh, the Lord said, and one of them says, the Lord Jesus said, in a given text, then we would say most likely that those nine got it right from their common ancestor and the tenth one is the renegade who added the word Jesus from some other evidence or for some other reason. So that's genealogical solidarity where the manuscripts have a strong agreement. We can push back the date of their common reading that we don't have material evidence for. But obviously the ultimate original date of these readings has to go back to the original New Testament. And we don't have any first century documents, so we have to uh, come up with hypotheses to give us the sense of what that original text really said. The third aspect of external evidence is going to be geographical distribution. If you think of genealogical solidarity as within a, uh, almost a funnel going through the centuries back to the earliest period of the beginnings of a particular text form, that's genealogical solidarity. If you think of geographical distribution as going wide in terms of the geographical region, but at the same time, you get kind of a cross of a twofold cord that's not easily broken. If I have, say, a bunch of manuscripts and versions and church fathers from the fifth century, and we've got one from the eastern part of the empire, another from the western part of the empire, another one down in the south, maybe another one in some other areas. You've got these manuscripts from the same period, these manuscripts and versions and fathers from the same period, and they agree with each other. That gives us geographical distribution. Now, if the reading is the kind of a reading that is not predictable, that is not the kind that a scribe could, would normally come up with on his own, and that two scribes in two different uh, locales would independently of one another come up with, then we would have to say, okay, that tells us that the geographical distribution is important, and we can push back the date of their common reading even further than the date of each one of those manuscripts. So these are the three areas of external evidence, date and character of the manuscripts, genealogical solidarity, and geographical distribution.
and scholars look at this kind of material evidence and work through the details of each textual problem on the basis of these three criteria to come up with the best estimate they've got as to the date of each reading and when it got into the textual stream on the basis of these, this external evidence. Let's put all the external evidence and internal evidence together and think through how we look at a particular textual problem. We're going to give as an example Revelation chapter 1 verse 4. In Revelation 1 4 we see that it says, John to the seven churches in Asia, grace to you and peace from the one who is and who was and who is to come. Now the wording from the one who is, is unusual. And in uh, one modern translation, the Net Bible, they say from, quote, he who is. They put this in quotes to show that uh, that's what John is doing in the original text. And what we've got here is simply this. After the preposition from, in English as well as in Greek, you cannot use something like the word he that's not correct grammar. It was not correct grammar in ancient Greek, it's not correct grammar in modern English. After from, if you're going to refer to the personal pronoun, you need to say from him. From him who was would be fine, but not from he who was, or from the one who was is fine. Now what we discover is that instead of from he, they have from him. So the majority of manuscripts and the majority of late manuscripts change the wording to from he to from him. That is correct grammatically. And you can see why scribes would naturally want to change it to from him if they understand that that's the correct grammar. One scholar said that uh, here in the book of Revelation, to say from he, he said unless this was intentional, it would be considered one of the worst grammatical blunders in all of ancient Greek literature. Indeed, it is so bad that it would be the equivalent of someone today writing to his mother and he says, Dear Mom, congratulate I, me just got a PhD in English Lit. We would consider that to be really atrocious grammar. That's what it looks like here in Revelation 1.4. But we've mentioned externally that we have the earlier manuscripts, so we've got date, We've got the better manuscripts that have from he, and we have the majority of later manuscripts that have from him. So we're looking at date and character. We're looking at geographical distribution. These manuscripts are distributed in other parts of the empire, and it's not just the Greek manuscripts, but other witnesses. And we're also looking at genealogical solidarity within each text form. The better witnesses seem to have from he. So externally, we'd say from he looks like it's original, but from Internal evidence, now how do we deal with this? Are we going to say the author just doesn't know Greek at all? He could hardly rub two sentences together without making huge mistakes. When 32 other times in the book of Revelation, that same preposition is used and he has the right case after it instead of the nominative case or from the, the idea of from he. And so John, who wrote the book of Revelation, certainly knew what the case was to be used after that preposition. And we also look at the transcriptional evidence where here are these scribes that they would have a natural tendency to want to replace he to him. So it would fit the grammar properly. Now, all of that suggests that the original wording would be from he. Both the external evidence and the internal evidence suggest from he is the original wording of Revelation 1.4. But as you look deeper into this, there's another level of, of uh, things that are going on here when we think in terms of the author's style, of his narrative art, uh, the context, these kinds of things, what we discover is this. In Revelation 1.3, he says, pay careful attention to the words of this prophecy and those who pay careful attention to them and keep them will be blessed. And then you get into the very next verse and he says, from he. Well, these uh, uh, first readers would say, wait a minute, John, you told us to pay careful attention to your words. You should be doing the same thing but you're not doing the same thing. Why should we pay careful attention to your words? Well, what he's got here is actually a strategy to help them understand his book. In our modern translations, we have uh, a reference section that typically goes down the middle of uh, two columns or on the side of its one column of references that 
this text is similar to and typically is referring back to. The book of Revelation quotes from the Old Testament hundreds of times, far more than any other text of the New Testament, far more than any other book of the New Testament. The Apocalypse, the book of Revelation, quotes from the Old Testament. And yet, remarkably, not once is any one of those quotes begun with something like, it stands written, it is written, God says, Moses says, Daniel says, anything like that. All of these quotations or allusions, if you will, are indirect in the sense that they have no formal introduction to signal, I'm quoting from the Old Testament text. And so as you look at this, what's remarkable also is you look into the text and you begin to discover that these quotations from the Old Testament are very frequently uh, kept in the original form of what the Greek translation of the Old Testament would have had it in, known as the Septuagint. And when you look at Revelation 1-4, we're looking at a text which would have been perhaps the most well-known verse of the entire Old Testament to Gentile converts in the first century AD. They come to faith in Jesus Christ and they say, who is this God that we worship? That's the same question that Moses asks God uh, on uh, Mount Sinai at the burning bush. And God says, I am who I am. Now in the Greek, in the Septuagint, it's uh, ego ami ha'on. And the ha'on here is also the ha'on that occurs after the preposition from in Revelation 1.4. But here's the point. That kind of language would be like saying, do you believe in we the people? If I were to say that to you, what I'd be talking about is, do you believe in the Constitution? Because I'm quoting from the preamble of the Constitution. Now, technically, it's not grammatically correct. I should say, do you believe in us, the people? But if I were to say, do you believe in us, the people? Then what I would be having is a text that you would not be as familiar with. You, you lose the illusion if you change the grammatical form of it. In ancient Greek, there were no quotation marks. So for John to write this text in a way that his readers would know what he's quoting from, he has to keep it in the original grammatical form that's found in the Greek Old, Old Testament, the Septuagint, so that they can read the text and say, aha, he's talking about this verse, Exodus 3.14. And so again, as we look at this text closer, when you see apa haon, which we have in Revelation 1.4, or from he, I think what John is saying is, this is from the immutable one, the one whose character does not change. This is from the Almighty God. But he doesn't say that explicitly because he's trying to get his readers to dive into the Old Testament to find out what he's talking about. In recent years, uh, a, a scholar on the apocalypse by the name of Dr. Greg Beale has argued that John's uh, texts where he uses what we would normally call bad grammar really line up in a remarkable number of places with those very same places where he's quoting from the Septuagint. And consequently, what Dr. Beale sees as happening is that John is getting his audience to read those Old Testament texts. It's like every time he uses bad grammar, it sends a flag up the pole that says, okay, now search and find out what I'm talking about. And you have to ask yourself, well, why doesn't he just say, this is from Daniel chapter nine, verse 13 or something. In part, the reason that John didn't quote Daniel 9.13 and say so is because there were no verse numbers back then. But another part of his strategy seems to be that he wants to communicate what he's saying to his readers without those who are uh, in charge of getting this letter from the island of Patmos to Asia Minor, which is today's Turkey, would be uh, understanding what's going on. If he said, for example, Domitian is a jerk, the emperor of Rome at the time, I don't think that letter could get out to those churches because he was the emperor and John was exiled on the island of Potmos. Consequently, he's got to get his message to them in a way that they will understand, but that the Romans will not understand. And this seems to be the strategy that he has uh, done to accomplish this. The very next verse quotes from the Psalms where we've got Psalm 89 quoted and it says, the faithful witness, the true one, and the form of the Greek is exactly the same as we have in the Septuagint of Psalm 89, while as it should not be that form in Revelation 1.5. So John starts with the very famous verse, the well-known verse to these Gentile converts, Exodus 3.14. And then from there, he moves into some other texts, Psalm 89, and all the way through the book of Revelation, 
he is quoting from parts of the Old Testament, keeping it in the original form so his readers will know, aha, he's telling us to go and see what text he's talking about so we can interpret what this book is all about. To sum up external and internal evidence, combining these two features to determine what the original wording of a particular variant is, or a particular place in the text is. When you look at the external evidence and you think about the date and character, the geographical distribution, the genealogical solidarity, you come to a conclusion that says, on the basis of the material evidence that I've got, I think I can come up with a hypothesis that reading A is the ancestor of reading B. That is, reading B came from reading A. Then you look at the internal evidence and you say, on the basis of intrinsic evidence and the basis of transcriptional evidence, I can say that reading B seems to be the ancestor of reading A. Now, when you have a conflict like that, you have to work through the issues and say, well, external evidence suggests that reading A was the, the, the first reading. Internal suggests that reading B is the first one. You work through that conflict always with a question in mind, choose the reading which best explains the rise of the others. But in the instance of Revelation 1.4, it's pretty easy for us to see how the data line up. Both the external and the internal evidence are on the same side. The external evidence suggests because of the dates of these manuscripts and because of their character, because of their genealogical solidarity and their geographical distribution, that what Revelation 1.4 originally said is from he who is. Now, when we look at the internal evidence, it also lines up with the external and says the same thing. It is most likely that the author wrote from he who is in light of what his agenda seems to be of equating unusual grammar with direct quotation from the Septuagint. And you also look at the transcriptional probability. What is the scribe likely to do? The scribe is likely to change this to more normal grammar, to good grammar, if you will, because he doesn't understand the nature of what the author is trying to accomplish. And so internal evidence and external evidence are used in combination to try to choose the reading which best explains the rise of the other, which as far as the evidence is concerned, that tells us this is the wording of the autograph in that place. An example of a textual problem that is a little bit more difficult to solve than the problem in Revelation 1-4 is found in Matthew chapter 27 verses 16 and 17. Here's a place where the external evidence and the internal evidence do not line up. In Matthew 27 16 it says, At that time they had in custody a notorious prisoner named Jesus Barabbas. In verse 17, so after they had assembled, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Jesus Barabbas, or Jesus who is called the Christ? Now, what's interesting here is that the word Jesus before Barabbas in each verse is only found in a handful of later manuscripts. The vast majority of our manuscripts, including our earliest manuscripts and our best manuscripts, do not have the name Jesus before Barabbas. In fact, when you look at the external evidence, you'd have to say date and character of manuscripts tells us that it says, whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Christ? And uh, this is why we have a difficulty here. The external evidence, date and character, geographical distribution, genealogical solidarity, all go in the direction of saying there is no name Jesus before Barabbas in either verse 16 or verse 17. However, when, it looks, when we look at the internal evidence, now we see a different picture. There is no reason that we can come up with that a scribe would accidentally add the name Jesus before Barabbas in either verse 16 or verse 17. In fact, you go back several verses before you see the name of Jesus listed in the text where you could have a possible, what's called dittography, writing twice what should have been written once. And it's, it's highly unlikely that a scribe could have accidentally added the name Jesus before Barabbas, especially in two verses right in a row. And so uh, th there's not a good argument to say that the scribes accidentally added the name Jesus. Is there a reason why a scribe would intentionally add the name Jesus be before the name of this notorious prisoner, Barabbas? The only reason 
that I can come up with as to why a scribe would do that is if you were a malicious scribe who wanted to give the same name that Jesus Christ had to this notorious prisoner. But these same manuscripts do not show any evidence of malice. They are faithful scribes, to the, for the most part, who are trying to copy out the text in front of them. But uh, they, they don't have evidence, they don't show evidence of changing the text for malicious reasons. In fact, they harmonize Matthew, Mark, and Luke in many places because the differences in the wording look to them almost like discrepancies. And consequently, uh, it's difficult to attribute faulty motives to these scribes in that part. Now, when we look at uh, the uh, transcriptional evidence, then we'd have to say uh, it, it's difficult to come up with a valid reason as to why any scribes would intentionally add the name Jesus before Barabbas. But let's ask the other question. Would scribes intentionally take away the name Jesus before the name Barabbas? And now, all of a sudden, there's all sorts of reasons, and the most immediate one that goes all the way back to Origen, who was a writer in the third century, a very influential uh, a church scholar whose writings influenced later generations of scribes, fathers, and other Christian leaders. He said that uh, there is no wicked person who has the name Jesus in Scripture, and therefore Barabbas doesn't have the first name of Jesus. It's not a very good argument, but it's the argument that he gave. It was kind of a genuflected argument saying, only Jesus Christ is the one we worship. We don't want to give this name to anybody else now. Old Testament. Joshua had that name. That's the, the name in, in, in Greek is Jesus, or we translate it as Jesus. But uh, no evil person had this name. Now, the reality is that there are plenty of reasons why scribes would not want to have the name Jesus before Barabbas, because Barabbas was a bad guy, and they don't want to see this comparison with Jesus Christ. However, as you look at this text, what's fascinating is you get into verse 17, and it says, whom should I release to you, Jesus, Barabbas, or Jesus, the one called Christ? Why would Pilate have to add the words, the one called Christ, unless he's making an explicit contrast with another Jesus who has a different surname, if you will? In other words, he's saying, if, if Jesus were not part of Barabbas, in Pilate's statement in verse 17, he would say, whom should I release to you, Barabbas or Jesus the Christ? But he wouldn't have to say Jesus the one called Christ. He might even say Jesus Christ. But he would not have to say Jesus the one called Christ. That is additional information to distinguish this Jesus from a different Jesus. So externally, we're dealing with not the best manuscripts that have this, but it is possible that they could well go back to the original all by themselves. And most scholars would say, yes, they most likely do, although we sure wish we had some better evidence for this. And internally, the evidence is extremely compelling that Matthew wrote originally Jesus in both Matthew 7, uh, 27, 16 and Matthew 27, 17. Well, let me sum up then. The external evidence seems to argue that there is no Jesus with the name Barabbas in either verse 16 or verse 17. But the internal evidence argues that the name Jesus Barabbas is found in both 16 and 17. And as we begin to examine these data, the question that we must always ask that is foremost in our minds is choose the reading which best explains the rise of the others. And clearly, in this instance, the reading that best explains the rise of the others is that Jesus Barabbas is what the evangelist wrote in both verse 16 and verse 17. And scribes as well as church fathers like Origen, eliminated the name Jesus before Barabbas because it was offensive to them to have that same name given to a notorious criminal that was the name of their Lord and Master Jesus Christ. The textual problem in Romans chapter 5 verse 1 is a very interesting one for illustrating what textual criticism is all about. It says, either, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, or, having been justified by faith, let us have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The only difference between these two texts is either we have peace or let us have peace. And the difference in Greek is a single letter. In we have peace, the word in Greek is echomen. 
it's uh, uh, the indicative verb of we have, which means we do have now in the present time peace. The other one is the subjunctive verb echamen. The difference between those two is an a ah and an o. Oh. It's either echamen or echamen. Let us have peace is echamen. We have peace, echamen. You can hardly hear that distinction as I'm saying it now, but here's where the issue gets complicated. In ancient Greek, uh, the omicron, which is the short o, and the omega, the long o, were pronounced alike. They were both pronounced o. So the first reading would be pronounced echamen, and the second one would be pronounced echamen, exactly alike. So how can we tell what Paul originally wrote here? Well, when we look at the manuscript evidence, when we look at the external evidence, most of it goes in the direction of saying the subjunctive with the omega, that is, let us have peace, is what was originally written. However, there's some interesting, very intriguing uh, evidence that suggests that maybe the indicative was in fact original. Our earliest manuscript for this passage is manuscript 0220, and it's a third century document that has just the end of Romans 4 and the beginning of Romans 5 in it. But we're not exactly sure what it said because at exactly this letter, in the middle of this word, the omicron or the omega is shorn in half. And so it's hard for us to tell, did the author write, uh, did the scribe write uh, the indicative or the subjunctive, the omicron or the omega. However, on the basis of how this scribe writes his other omicrons and omegas, uh, scholars have been able to determine that almost surely he wrote an omicron here. And consequently, it doesn't curve quite as much as the omega as you can see on this slide. So consequently, uh, the earliest manuscript has, we have peace with God. But then you get into the fourth century, and now our manuscripts have, let us have peace with God. Although uh, they have been corrected later on, sometimes perhaps at the same time when the manuscript left the scriptorium and went to uh, the church where it was heading, or it was corrected in later centuries. So the external evidence, we would have to say, for the most part, goes in the direction of the subjunctive, let us have peace, although there are some important and early witnesses that have the indicative. When you look at the internal evidence, however, now a different uh, situation emerges. Up until this point in Paul's letter to the Romans, he has used an imperative only once in what's called a hortatory subjunctive, uh, just uh, once or twice through here, a hortatory subjunctive means it's a command to the group of which the author himself is a part. And so it means, let us do something. After this point, there are over 60 imperatives, 60 commands in Greek from this point on in Romans, and there's seven hortatory subjunctives. So what we have is the author is moving in the direction of making the indicatives of the faith into what we should be doing. The, the statements of what God has done in Christ now become statements or foundations on which we build how our behavior should be. And in fact, in the rest of this chapter, Paul doesn't seem to use other than indicatives. He begins in the next chapter and moves into the imperatives. So at this stage in his writing of Romans, he is building that foundation of what God has done. Not only that, but when we get to verse 10 in this chapter, uh, the assumption is that we have been reconciled to God in the sense that therefore we do have peace. Unless Paul is stating it explicitly in verse 1, it's difficult to see why he would all of a sudden assume it in verse 10. So internally, it looks as if what he's doing is saying we do have peace with God, and on that basis now he builds his argument into where he's going so that when he gets to chapter 6, now he can start giving commands about how Christians should relate uh, to God and how they should be obedient to him. So most scholars would say the internal evidence here, like in Matthew 27, 16, and 17 in an earlier lecture we uh, noted that, the internal evidence is against the external evidence. But the external evidence in this case is much more balanced, although it's in favor of the subjunctive, it's not radically in favor of the subjunctive so that we just uh, say we've got very little evidence for the indicative. But the internal evidence is pretty compelling that what Paul wrote here originally was we have peace with God. And therefore the combination of external and internal evidence suggests that the indicative is what is uh, what he originally wrote. And so most textual critics looking at this passage would say 
In Romans 5.1, what the autographic text says is, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. How do we define a textual variant? What constitutes a textual variant as far as textual criticism is concerned? That is, scholars determine how many numbers of variants we have among the manuscripts, and it's important to know what actually is a variant. A textual variant is any place in the wording of the text where there is a difference. Now, what this does not count is capitalization or punctuation, because the ancient manuscripts would not have had a distinction between the capitalized words and the non-capitalized words, and they didn't use any punctuation. So as far as the original text is concerned, neither capitalization nor punctuation are important. However, what is important is the wording, the word order, and even the spelling of words, and those all count as textual variants. There are essentially five types of textual variants that scholars uh, would recognize when it comes to the New Testament. The first is what's called an omission. That is, if you look at a particular text and you compare it to a manuscript and that manuscript lacks a word or more than one word, that would be called an omission. Another kind, just the opposite of this, is an addition. So you've got this manuscript that differs from the text that you're comparing it to and it adds a word or more than one word. That's called an addition. What's the size of omissions and additions? Well, the smallest, by definition, would be a single word. The largest is as much as 12 verses. And we have two places in the New Testament where 12 whole verses were either added to the text or were deleted from the text. It certainly cannot be, in either of these places, considered to be an unintentional change because two scribes in different parts of the ancient world could not possibly have come up with exactly the same wording for 12 verses. So there must be some kind of a genetic or genealogical connection, uh, connection among these manuscripts going back very early. The two places are John 7, 53 through 8, 11, the story of the woman caught in adultery, and we've discussed that in an earlier lesson. And the other place is Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 20. Those 12 verses are found in the majority of manuscripts, but our two earliest manuscripts lack them, and we'll talk about that in a later lecture. Apart from those two places of 12 verses, the next largest textual variant that is found in English translation, in other words, the, the kind of variant that uh, most students of the Bible through translation know about, is only two verses long. And then we have uh, some that are one verse, so we've only got a couple dozen or so that are one or two verses, two places where it's 12 verses. And then we've got, after that, phrases and clauses and all the way down to individual words. And that number is in the tens of thousands, if not more, of omissions or additions at that stage. Besides omissions and additions, there are three other kinds of textual variants. One is a transposition, and this has to do with the word order change, where a word order can change in terms of just two words, where it's Jesus Christ versus Christ Jesus, and that's a typical textual variant we see in Paul's letters. Did he write Jesus Christ or did he write Christ Jesus? Those words are transposed very frequently among the manuscripts. Transpositions can also involve a number of larger uh, issues, and one manuscript, Codex Bezai, that's at Cambridge University, transposes at times as many as nine or ten words, so the order gets uh, in a different sequence. It makes sense, but that probably tells us that this scribe is copying out a text where he's grabbing whole bites at a time, large bitefuls at a time, and writing out what he thinks it should say. And uh, that's why this manuscript is probably the most bizarre manuscript among our New Testament texts, in that it changes the text more than any other manuscript out there. Now, besides omission, addition, and transposition, we have substitution is the fourth kind of a textual variant. Substitution is simply the substitution of one word for another word. So in John 4, 1, when Jesus knew, or when the Lord knew. Is it Jesus or is it the Lord? That's a substitution. Those are the kinds of things we have as well. And when it comes to uh, these textual variants, sometimes you can get a combination where you can have a transposition of four or five words, but where you have an omission in another variant, or you have an addition, to, uh, addition in another variant after that. Or you might have 
these four or five words that are transposed and there's a couple of substitutions in there. Each of those has to be treated as a discrete textual variant. Finally, there's what we might call a total rewrite, where the text is so different in one manuscript than what it is in another that we just give up and say we can't classify this by transposition and omission and substitution. It has to be just a total rewriting of the text. And again, it's Codex Bezae or Contrabrigiensis at Cambridge that leads the charge in having total rewrites of the text. How many textual variants do we have among our New Testament manuscripts? Well, there have been a couple of different calculations, and one has been something that's been out there since 1965 in a popular New Testament introduction, and that count is it's the source of a folk myth, if you will. It's completely wrong, and we need to deal with that first. In 1965, that author said that a textual variant is one in which any time you have a number of manuscripts that differ with a different number of manuscripts, you count each manuscript that differs as a variant. But this is a very unorthodox and unacceptable definition for a textual variant, and yet it has gotten into all sorts of popular literature in the last uh, 45 years that has uh, infected uh, popular culture, especially within the church, where people say, oh, well, there aren't really that many textual variants if you understand that each variant involves a number of, of uh, counts as just involving one manuscript. So uh, at that time, there were known something in the neighborhood of 150, 2,000 variants that this author knew about. And he said, well, here's how you actually count a variant. If we have 1,000 manuscripts that read Jesus, in this particular verse and a thousand manuscripts that read Lord in the same verse, that means that there's a thousand variants from the wording Jesus. That's not true. That's not how we should count the textual variants. And so this was a way for him to say, because there's a couple hundred thousand variants, when you count how many manuscripts are, every manuscript that counts against the text counts as a variant. Consequently, it didn't look like there were that many variants among our manuscripts. The real way to count variants, however, is this. Every single time you have a change in the wording among these witnesses, that counts as a variant. Regardless of how many manuscripts you have that back it up, it still counts as just one variant. So how many variants do we have among our New Testament manuscripts? The best estimate that we have today is somewhere in the neighborhood of 400,000, possibly as high as 500,000. And again, what this means is every time I see a difference in the manuscripts where the wording is different, that counts as a variant. When we look at the number of words we have in the New Testament, there are approximately 140,000 words in the Greek New Testament as it was originally written. Give or take a few hundred here and there, it's actually 138,162 in our standard published Greek New Testament. So when I look at that and I say, there's 400,000 variants among our witnesses. What that tells me is that for every word I have in the Greek New Testament, there are approximately two and a half variants. Or as one scholar is fond of saying, we have more variants among our manuscripts than we have words in the original New Testament. So it's a, a very high number on one level. In the next lesson, we're gonna look at the nature of these variants and determine how significant this issue really is. But for now, just to understand there's about 400,000, maybe as high as 500,000 variants among our witnesses uh, and only about 140,000 words in the Greek New Testament. That means we have approximately two and a half variants for every word in the New Testament, which is one of the reasons why we need to examine these manuscripts and try to determine the original as best we can. There's kind of an epilogue to the number of variants and it is simply this. The reason we have so many variants is because we have so many manuscripts. If scholars had only one copy of the Greek New Testament today, a handwritten copy, we would have no variants. Two copies, now we'd start getting a few thousand variants. Three copies would get more. But the point is, we have far more textual variants for our New Testament witnesses than we do for any other Greco-Roman literature because we have so many manuscripts.
And yet the more manuscripts that we have, the more that we can examine and, and really look at intently, the more we can start tracing this genealogical relationship among these manuscripts, which helps us to ultimately get back to the autographic text. What is the nature of these textual variants, these thousands upon thousands of variants that we have among our New Testament manuscripts? If one just had the number of 400,000 to 500,000 variants, one might think there's no way we could possibly get back to the original text of the New Testament. But when you examine the nature of these variants, now things come into view that you might not otherwise recognize. Here's a way we can categorize these variants. We can do it into four different groups. And the two poles on each of these groups or in, the, in this categorization is meaningful on the one hand and viable on the other. By meaningful, what I mean is that it changes the meaning of the text to some degree. By viable, I mean that it has the likelihood or the possibility, a distinct possibility of going back to the original wording uh, and that means it has to be found in sufficient manuscripts either that are early enough or important enough or that could uh, plausibly go back to the wording of the original. You could refer to an earlier lesson on Matthew 27, 16 and 17 that has some fairly late manuscripts, but they are significant enough that they could go back to the original because they are belonging to their own textual family and so that would be considered a viable variant. So meaningful and viable are the two poles, and here's the way we can categorize all textual variants. First, those that are neither meaningful nor viable. Second, those that are not meaningful but are viable. Third, those that are not viable but are meaningful. And fourth, those that are both meaningful and viable. Well, let's examine these. In, in this order. First, we'll start with those that are neither meaningful nor viable. That means that it doesn't affect the meaning of the text and they don't have much plausibility of going back to the original. In fact, we'll take this category with the next one, those that are not meaningful but are viable, and we'll group those two together. Well over 75% of all of our textual variants belong to these two categories. The most common kind of change we have among our manuscripts are spelling changes. And the most common spelling change we have among the manuscripts is what's called a movable new. This is the use of the letter N at the end of a word when the next word starts with a vowel. Do I put the letter N in there when I have a vowel afterwards? Well, just like in English, we have a book and apple. So in Greek, you have a movable new before a word that starts with a vowel. And the older manuscripts always had that new there. They didn't take it off. The later manuscripts start to nuance it, so they would drop the new when the next word started with a consonant. That's the most common textual variant we have among our New Testament manuscripts. It affects nothing. And so spelling differences, especially those that are not meaningful but may or may not be viable, account for a good 75% of all of our textual variants. The next group, those that are meaningful but not viable, is a significant group. And it's, uh, again, this, is, this will probably be about 24% or really more than 24% of all of our textual variants belong to this category. They are variants where uh, it, it makes for a significant change in the meaning of the text, but there's hardly any plausibility that that wording could go back to the original. It may be found in one late medieval manuscript or one group of versions that don't have a very good pedigree or a few church fathers that talk about a variant, but they don't really go back to the original. One of the uh, interesting ones is in 1 Thessalonians 2.7, and this really borders on neither meaningful nor viable, but in 1 Thessalonians 2.7, Paul says to the Thessalonians that we were little children among you, or he says we were gentle among you. Now those two variants are both meaningful and viable. It changes the meaning of the text whether Paul says we were gentle among you or we were little children. And many scholars would say it has to say gentle because it goes on, it says, like a nursing, uh, like a nursing mother. And so does this mean that Paul is saying we were little children among you like a nursing mother? That would be too harsh of a metaphorical shift for Paul.
Uh, he does some things like this elsewhere, but not quite that extreme. Or if you repunctuate the text, you could say, we were little children among you, period. Like a nursing mother cares for her children, something along those lines, Paul goes on and says that. So if you put a hard stop there, there is not nearly as uh, disruptive a, a metaphor uh, shift. However, gentle and little children, there's only one letter difference in Greek. It's either napioi or apioi. And the word that precedes it ends with a new. So in 1 Thessalonians 2, 7, we have Eganathemen napioi or Eganathemen apioi. But read together, Eganathemen napioi? What did I say? Did I say napioi or apioi? It's very difficult to tell, and consequently, this has created a, an extremely difficult textual problem for scholars to try to figure out. But there's another variant that sounds like apioi, sounds like napioi, but it's sufficiently different that it could not have been created quite in the same way that these uh, were created. And it only occurs in one late manuscript. It's the word hippoi. We became horses among you. Now, it's a funny variant. And uh, it's obvious that Paul and Silas could not have become horses in any capacity, no matter what you're thinking about. Th that makes no sense here. So most would say that's not a meaningful variant at all. But it may be that we've got a disgruntled USC fan when USC lost the uh, Rose Bowl against uh, the University of Texas in 2005. And so he says we became horses among it. Who knows? But uh, whatever the, the, the reason is, this is not at all a viable variant. There are plenty of these non-viable variants that are meaningful, but they just don't have a sufficient pedigree to go back to the original text. The smallest category of variants is those that are both meaningful and viable. This is less than 1% of all textual variants are both meaningful and viable variants. That is, they have some good plausibility, a good possibility of going back to the original, and they change the meaning of the text to some degree. Let me give an illustration of a textual variant that is both meaningful and viable. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 18, we read that the number of the beast is 666. Everyone knows the Antichrist number is 666. Well, not so fast. There's a manuscript at the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. It's a 5th century manuscript, and it's probably our second most important manuscript for the book of Revelation, and it has the number of the beast as 616. Most scholars think 616 is not the number of the beast, it's the neighbor of the beast. You know, he lives a few doors down. But with one manuscript, it didn't seem like it had much plausibility. Except that Irenaeus, the second century church father, spoke about textual variants, and he spoke specifically about this textual variant, and he said, the better manuscripts, the earlier manuscripts that I've seen have 666, but there are some that have 616. So the number 616 we know existed in the uh, second century because Irenaeus is writing in the late second century. But we also know that he is commenting on this thinking that the better manuscripts have 666. So its pedigree may not be as good as that, but it may well be that Irenaeus is motivated to say that the number is 666 instead of 616. Up until a few years ago, this was the only manuscript that we actually had that had the number of the beast as 616. But then at the Ashmolean Museum at Oxford University, they found another manuscript that had been excavated decades ago and had been in the library waiting for some papyrologists to go through and examine these documents. And this manuscript also has the number of the beast as 616. It is now our earliest fragment for Revelation chapter 13 in its third, possibly fourth century but it says 616 like this other manuscript in Paris says. And so consequently, here's a, a reading that is both meaningful and viable. It has a sufficient pedigree to possibly go back to the original text. We have to examine this in terms of external evidence and internal evidence to make the decision. And yet, when the day is done, we may not have a very strong feel as to which wording is original. Most likely 666 is, but it may be that some scholars can make a great case out for 616 going back to the original text. It's going to take hundreds of hours of research to determine this, and even when it's all over with, there's not uh, absolute certainty as to what the original text is. But it's a meaningful variant. It's the kind of a variant that if English Bibles and Bibles in other languages translated this as the number of the beast is 616, 
it would probably send several tons of popular Christian literature to the flames. Just Google 616 or Google 666 sometime on the internet and you'll discover all sorts of crazy ideas about what 666 is all about. But if it says 616, then all bets are off. Now they have to go back and uh, do their uh, strange uh, rantings about uh, these mysterious numbers. Now, we've talked about the manuscripts in terms of are they papyri, are they majuscules, minuscules, or lectionaries. But now we want to think about the manuscripts in terms of their contents that they have. And there are four different groups uh, that uh, the manuscripts fall into. Do they have the Gospels? Do they have Acts and the Catholic Epistles, also known as the General Letters? These are the seven letters that we have in the New Testament other than those by Paul or um, allegedly by Paul, namely Hebrews. Uh, so the third category is the Pauline uh, corpus, which includes 14 letters. It includes Hebrews because the early church believed that uh, Hebrews was written by Paul. And so we always group Hebrews with uh, the Pauline corpus. And the fourth group is the book of Revelation. So these are designated E-A-P-R, E for Evangelist, A for Acts, and the Catholics, P for Paul, and R for Revelation. Now, one of the things that's interesting to think about is how many copies we have of each one of these groups of manuscripts. To be sure, some of the manuscripts have more than just one of those categories. We have manuscripts that have almost any number of combinations. You can have the Gospels and Paul's letters, or the Gospels in the book of Revelation, or you might have the Catholic letters in the book of Revelation, or you might have the Catholic letters in Paul's letters. But uh, when you think in terms of what manuscripts we have, or the number of manuscripts we have that have each one of these categories, the numbers are very illuminating. The Gospels, far and away, more than any other category, are, are best represented. We have about 2,000 or more manuscripts that have the Gospels in them of the 57, 5,800 manuscripts that we have of the Greek New Testament. The next largest category is Paul's letters, which is somewhere in the neighborhood of about 700 to 800 manuscripts. So it's about one third as many as we have of the Gospels. It's significantly less. The next category after that is Acts and the general letters or the Catholic epistles uh, designated with the letter A. Now these manuscripts comprise uh, about 650 to 700, 750 manuscripts have uh, the Acts and uh, the general epistles in them, or portions thereof. So it's pretty close to what we have for Paul. But then the final category, which is really bringing up the rear, is the book of Revelation. We only have about 300 to 350 manuscripts of the book of Revelation in Greek among our New Testament manuscripts. The question is, why is it that there is such a great disparity between the copies of the Gospels on the one end and the book of Revelation on the other? Well, the fundamental reason has to do with the canon. That is, how long it took before particular books were recognized as scripture and accepted into the canon that we call the New Testament. The book of Revelation struggled for a long time to get in, unlike the Gospels, which were readily accepted and treated as these are authoritative because they contain the words of Jesus Christ, and consequently they were very soon recognized as a Christian scripture. Paul's letters uh, completely were recognized as uh, scripture uh, shortly thereafter, or perhaps even at the same time as the Gospels. All of them, except for the book of Hebrews, that one had a little bit of a more difficult history to it. Then you've got the uh, uh, Acts and the Catholic letters at various stages of acceptance. Some of them early on, like Acts and First Peter and this kind of thing, First John. Others took much longer to get accepted. So canonicity is an issue that affected the copying of these manuscripts. What's interesting, though, is if the Gospels are accepted very early on, then that means you get to a 4th century copy of the Gospels. There may be 10 generations of copies between it and the original text. But you get to a 4th century copy of the book of Revelation, and there may be only three or four copies intermediately between the original and the copy that we have in the 4th century. So one of the interesting things on this is that the book of Revelation in the 4th century most likely is going to come closer to the form that it was in when John wrote it in the 1st century 
than those gospel manuscripts in the fourth century. One of the other implications that we can begin to think about on this is that if we have nearly eight to ten times as many copies of the gospels as we do of the book of Revelation, what does that tell us about what the early Christians valued when it came to these New Testament documents? To them, by far the most important thing was the life and teaching and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, which they read in the Gospels very clearly, while as not all of the rest of the books of the New Testament speak about such things. How do scholars classify Greek New Testament manuscripts? Well, there's a couple of different organizations, and one of them is very simple and straightforward, but it's not the primary way in which they're classified. We'll address this first. You could classify these manuscripts by the material that they're written on. And in that case, there are three kinds of manuscripts. There are those that are written on papyri, which is an ancient substance kind of like paper. And we have a, 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 a lesson on what the papyri were all about that you can watch a video on that. Uh, secondly, are those that are written on parchment or animal skins. And third are those that are written on paper. The later manuscripts tend to be written on paper. Those are the three materials and how manuscripts can be uh, written. And this is not just Greek manuscripts, but all other manuscripts. Now, the way that Greek New Testament manuscripts are classified, though, is a fourfold classification that is partially content, partially uh, material and partially handwriting. It's a, it's a hodgepodge kind of an approach, but it has served scholars well for uh, decades, even centuries, and uh, I don't think it's going to be changed anytime soon. The four groups are papyri, uncials or majuscules, uh, then minuscules and lectionaries. Papyri are manuscripts that, as their name implied, are written on the material papyri or papyrus. And these manuscripts are, uh, generally speaking, our very oldest manuscripts of the New Testament, and they are the fewest in number. We have approximately 125 papyri known to exist today of the New Testament. And they are numbered with a capital P and then the number in sequence. So 1 through 125 is what we have essentially today. The next group of manuscripts are the uncials or majuscules, and these are manuscripts that are written with capital letters. That's what uncial or majuscule means. But all of them, by definition, are written on parchment. And also, by definition, they are continuous text manuscripts. That is, they have a whole book in its normal chapters in its normal order. The other kinds of manuscripts are lectionaries that don't have uh, a whole book uh, organized. They'll have snippets from a uh, book. For the example, they have 15 or 20 verses that are to be read out loud for that day, and then they'll skip over to another section. So you might have a Gospels lectionary that quotes from Mark, and then it might quote from John next, and then Luke, and then back to Mark, and then Matthew, this kind of a thing. But continuous text manuscripts are all the others except lectionaries. So an uncial or majuscule manuscript means it's written on parchment, it's continuous text, and it's capital letters. And those manuscripts are designated in one of two ways, either by letters or by numbers that start with the number zero every time. Now, if it's by letters, we start with the Latin alphabet, and so we, we don't have J, but we go through and have the rest of the letters. And then after that, we have the Greek alphabet for those manuscripts where the Greek letter is not identical to a form in the Latin alphabet. So you can't have a codex zeta because we already have the letter Z. You can't have a codex eta, which looks like a capital H because we already have uh, a manuscript H. So you have the, the Latin alphabet followed by the Greek alphabet and these manuscripts take us through the first few dozen and then we peel off into the numbered manuscripts only. All of those manuscripts that have a Latin or a Greek letter also have a number. And so Codex Vaticanus is also known as Codex B, and it's also known as Codex 03. We have other manuscripts. Uh, Codex N is also known as 022. Now, there's one manuscript that has a different alphabet that it follows, and that's the very first one in the list. It's known as Codex Sinaiticus. This is a fourth century manuscript. 
that Constantine von Tischendorf, a German textual critic in the middle of the 1800s, discovered at uh, St. Catherine's Monastery at Mount Sinai, at the base of Mount Sinai in Egypt. And in 1859, he brought that out of the monastery. And we'll talk about that at some point, uh, about uh, why he took that out, whether the monks really allowed him to do so or not. But the point here is that he was so excited about that manuscript that he gave it a new designation to give it priority to over the others. And he gave it the Hebrew letter Aleph. So it would stand at the front of the list of all these manuscripts. It's very similar to what we see in the yellow pages when somebody says triple A pest control. And then somebody else says, well, I want to be the first one who's noticed. I'll have five A pest control. It's just a matter of Put, giving it priority by alphabet, alphabetization, and consequently Tischendorf got to have his manuscript, a very important manuscript, listed first among all the others. That's uncials, majuscules, Greek letters, Latin letters, or in one case Hebrew letter, and all of them also have a new numerical designation that starts with zero. We have over 300 uh, majuscule manuscripts today. The third category are those that are minuscules, and these also have to do with handwriting, and that's why they're described as minuscules. They are written on parchment or they are on paper. Now, these minuscule manuscripts are almost always later than the majuscule manuscripts, and the basic difference is that the majuscules are capital letter manuscripts, minuscules are cursive hand, but they're later. The earliest minuscule manuscript we have is from the 9th century, and it goes all the way up to the 18th century for the, the few stragglers we have at the very end that are still written by hand after the time of the printing press and are apparently not copies of a printed Greek New Testament. We have over 2,900 manuscripts that have a minuscule number to them right now. These are continuous text manuscripts, and they start with number one all the way to 2,905, I think is the latest number we have on these manuscripts now. Again, they start from the 9th century to about the 18th. The majuscules go as early as the 3rd century and as late as about the 10th. And then finally, the last category are lectionaries. Lectionaries can be written on parchment, or they can be written on paper, and a lectionary also, which is very unusual, uh, can be either minuscule text or majuscule text. It's unusual in the sense that it could be almost anything, but the thing that categorizes that a lectionary is not the material that it's written on, not the kind of letters that are used, but is it a continuous text manuscript or something else. The lectionary is something else. It's the kind of text that has passages that are read for a particular day of the week or a particular Saturday or Sunday lesson and the ancient church began to have the practice of reading various passages of scripture on certain holy days, uh, certain Saturdays, certain Sundays and this became the lectionary system that involves uh, a couple of thousand of manuscripts. The oldest lectionary we have goes all the way back to the 5th century, and they go as late as the 17th or 18th century as well, just like the minuscules do. Altogether, we have almost 5,800 numbered Greek New Testament manuscripts that uh, exist today, and uh, they are broken into these four categories, papyri, majuscules, minuscules, and lectionaries. categories of witnesses to the New Testament that are other than the Greek manuscripts include three things. First are versions, second are patristics, and third are other. Let me start with other because that's the one that we can dispense with easily enough. The other category involves things like talismans, which were essentially ancient lucky charms that people would use to ward off demons and this sort of thing. And those talismans uh, often had scripture in them, especially from the book of Revelation. Uh, but uh, New Testament scholarship does not regard talismans as uh, serious witnesses to the New Testament text. So uh, for the last uh, 50 or so years, they have not been regarded uh, at all in uh, trying to determine the wording of the original text of the New Testament. Besides the talismans, what else belongs to the other category would be ostraca, uh, the text of scripture on other than actual manuscripts that is not on parchment paper or papyrus but on uh, broken pottery 
on uh, walls, cave uh, walls, uh, uh, on stone, this kind of thing. The last item in this other category would be early Christian papyri in which they quote from the New Testament, but the papyri themselves are not the text of the New Testament. And we have uh, early Christian writers uh, writing to friends and quoting from this passage or that passage. Uh, and so far, those have really not been cataloged or really even examined uh, by New Testament textual critics. Now, the broad categories that are very important besides the Greek New Testament manuscripts are the versions and the, fa and the fathers. As far as the versions are concerned, what this simply means is the translation of the New Testament into other ancient languages. And a version, therefore, is the translation of the, uh, the Greek New Testament into Latin or Syriac or Coptic. Those are the three leading versions or Ethiopic, Georgian, Gothic, Old Church, Slavonic, Arabic, uh, Armenian, all sorts of uh, uh, different translations. And these versions, uh, as I said, the most important ones are going to be the Latin, the Coptic, and the Syriac. And that's in part because they are direct translations from the Greek, and in part because they are the earliest translations that we have of the Greek New Testament into these other languages. We'll see the importance of the versions when we discuss uh, in a later uh, lecture uh, the textual problem of 1 Timothy 3.16. The fathers or the patristics is the last category of non-Greek manuscript witnesses and these are quotations from the New Testament by church leaders, bishops and presbyters and, and uh, deacons and uh, scholars of the ancient church as they're writing either commentaries or homilies, sermons. And these church fathers, uh, for the most part, are broken down into three languages, Greek or Latin or Syriac. Now, the church fathers, uh, we have them as early as the late first century. And they go all the way through typically the 13th century is normally how they're canoned. But the church fathers are uh, in a little bit of a different category than the versions because it's not the continuous text of Scripture. They are quotations. Now, it might be length quotations from Scripture, but they need to be treated a little differently from how the versions are treated. I'll discuss the problems and the value of versions and the problems and value of uh, the church fathers in uh, later lessons. The value of the ancient versions is that once the Greek New Testament is translated into another language, then that language uh, text of the, of the New Testament, generally speaking, takes on a life of its own. It no longer is interacting with the Greek text. And so if you can find out what the earliest form of that version is, you can find out what that Greek text that it uh, translated was saying at about that time. In other words, uh, we know that the Latin uh, text of the New Testament was translated as early as the second century. And so when we look at Latin manuscripts and we can determine the earliest uh, form of the Latin text, what we can tell is that that form of the uh, Latin text is uh, a second century text that uh, duplicates what the Greek text was before it. Now that's the great value of the versions as well as placing those versions in ge different geographical locations. So you've got the Latin text that's going to be especially in the West, and then you've got the uh, Coptic text of the New Testament that's especially in the South, and the Syriac text which is especially in the East. Those are the three most important uh, early versions. Now, there are problems to the versions at the same time. First of all, we are trying to reconstruct the text of a version to determine what its original form is. We don't have those second century Latin manuscripts anymore. We have later manuscripts that point to the source of the Latin text being done in the second century. But we don't have the uh, second century manuscripts. Uh, so that's one of the problems that we've got is we have to reconstruct the Latin text to figure out what that second century text said. But another problem with these ancient versions is the uh, principles of translation that the translators followed. Did they follow something like a dynamic or a functional equivalent translation, or did they do a more rigorous formal equivalent translation of uh, the Greek text? Those that are more formal, that are almost, we might say, bad Latin or bad Coptic or bad Syriac, are going to be the versions that are the most valuable for us for getting back to the underlying Greek text because they're translating it 
so uh, woodenly that we can see what that Greek text really said. But if a translation is loose or is very fluid or very dynamic, then it's much more difficult to see what that underlying Greek text said. The third problem that we have with some of these ancient versions is that they are not translations directly from the Greek, but they are translations from an intermediate language, and consequently all of the difficulties we already have with looking at a version trying to get back to its underlying Greek text and what the principles of translation were are compounded by this two-stage translation that's uh, two steps removed from the original Greek. The final problem that we have with uh, the versions has to do with the internal language makeup and especially dealing with grammar and idioms. In one language, for example, they might have a, uh, a gender for a particular word that is masculine, while as in the translation of it into another language, that, that same word might be feminine or neuter. And consequently, in uh, say Ephesians chapter 1 verse 14, where in the Greek it speaks of the spirit as a down payment, in 114 it says, who is a down payment? Now what we have in Greek is the word spirit is neuter in verse 13, and then in verse 14, the who, which goes back to the Greek, is also most likely neuter, but the word down payment is uh, masculine. But in Latin, everything reverses. The word spirit in Latin is masculine. The word down payment is neuter. And consequently, uh, to judge what that relative pronoun uh, there is, is it it or is it he, uh, that's going to be a, a far more difficult thing to assess. So the differences in the grammatical structure between the two languages often give us a false reading as to what that uh, original Greek must have said if they are just the opposite uh, from one another. Uh, another issue would be uh, the uh, definite article, the word the. In Greek, we have it, but in Latin, there is no the, and consequently, the Latin cannot properly represent uh, when there is a textual variant between having the article and not having the article. So its, its voice is completely nil at those points. At the same time, the great value of the versions is especially when you're dealing with a phrase or a whole verse, whether it's there or not, or what the wording of it is, because the, the basic grammar of the language is not going to inter interfere with that. If you add a verse or take it away, it's not going to be due to uh, grammatical differences between two languages. It will be due to whether it had that in the Greek manuscript that it was copying from or not. So to sum up, these are the, uh, uh, the, the value and the problems of the versions for trying to get back to the autographic text of the Greek New Testament. In terms of the Church Fathers, there are three things that we want to discuss. First is how many quotations are by the Church Fathers of the New Testament. Secondly, what the value of the patristic writings are for recovering the text of the New Testament. And third are the problems of using the Fathers to access that text and get back to the uh, original wording. In terms of the number of quotations, uh, it has been calculated that in fact tabulated that there are over one million quotations by the church fathers of the new testament now the church fathers span a period from the late first century all the way typically through the 13th century and to have over a million quotations of a text that is less than 8,000 verses is absolutely astounding uh, some of these verses get quoted many, many times. Others get quoted just a handful of times. But the Holy Testament is duplicated more than once in these uh, church fathers and their writings. Now, in terms of the value of the fathers, there's really three things in which they are especially valuable. The first value of the church fathers is that they actually pinpoint for us the use of the text in a particular location at a particular time. We know about the church fathers who lived in Antioch of Syria or who may have lived in Caesarea Maritima or uh, Alexandria, Egypt. And so these fathers are using the text. We know uh, the dates of the fathers and we know the places of the fathers when they're using these texts. That helps us to locate a particular reading in a place and time when we don't have sufficient evidence from the Greek manuscripts, especially through the first three or four centuries where uh, the, the manuscripts are not as uh, frequent as what we get in later centuries. So the fathers help us to pinpoint the text in uh, uh, space and time. 
Uh, a second value is that what this also helps us to do is to understand what's known as text types. Most textual critics today would say that the New Testament manuscripts are organized into three or four categories known as text types. These are broad families in which the manuscripts are copied uh, whether it's by an official recension or just by the natural growth of the text in a particular region. And so you have uh, the Alexandrian text type, which uh, grew up in and around Alexandria, Egypt. You have the Byzantine text type, which grew uh, up and around in uh, Constantinople, and to some degree, uh, perhaps uh, Caesarea Maritima. And you also have the uh, Western text type, which started in the East, but ended up going to the West and became really the text of Rome and its environs. So the fathers help us to fix the text types that we have in a particular locale as well. And this was some work that a fellow by the name of uh, B.H. Streeter did in the 1920s to locate the text types by using the church fathers and help us to understand better the nature of these various regional originals that were copied by hand for centuries in each locale, for example. A third value of the church fathers is that there are times when these patristic writers actually discuss textual variants. And when that happens, they are worth their weight in gold. They will talk about here's a text that has this reading, but this manuscript has this reading. Now, they won't necessarily specify the manuscripts, but they'll say things like, uh, well, for example, Eusebius talks about the longer ending of Mark's gospel in Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 20. And he says, most of the manuscripts that I know about don't have these 12 verses. And of course, he didn't say 12 verses because verse numbers were not added to the Greek New Testament until the year 1551. But he talked about that ending. He said most of the Greek manuscripts or most of the manuscripts he knew about did not have those verses. And then later, Jerome adds to this, most of the Greek manuscripts that he looked at did not have those. This may imply that now by Jerome's day, that ending, those 12 verses, had been found in other versions, in particular Latin, which was the language that he was most acquainted with. So these church fathers talk to us about uh, the particular variants as they occurred and what their frequency is in various centuries. We read in later centuries that another church father is quoting from uh, Mark 16, and this becomes the standard text, and he says this is what is found in most of his manuscripts. So there are some people who like to uh, count our text of the New Testament or uh, do textual criticism by counting manuscripts. But the problem with that is when do you count and what do you count? If you're counting in the 20th century and looking at all the manuscripts that are still in existence, then we can have the majority of manuscripts that have a particular reading. But if you go back in earlier centuries and you ask this church father, who may have had access to a great number of manuscripts, what he knows about, and he'll say the vast majority of the manuscripts that I know about have this wording, but not that wording. And consequently, when they discuss these textual variants, and when they talk about the frequency of a particular reading that occurs in the manuscripts that they are aware of, especially if they are a patristic writer who has access to a number of different uh, resources, that becomes extremely valuable for doing textual criticism. In terms of the problems that the fathers pose for us in trying to get back to the autographic text of the New Testament, there are essentially four uh, difficulties that they, uh, they create. Uh, first of all, we don't have the actual original manuscripts of these church fathers. What we have are copies of them that are, generally speaking, of medieval origin. And consequently, we have to do textual criticism on these extant or now existing manuscripts to try to get back to the original wording of what that father actually wrote. And when we do that, then we can try to reconstruct the Greek text or the New Testament text that he's actually using. So the first problem then is we don't have the church father's originals. We have copies of them that we have to use to get back to what that church father actually said when he's quoting from the New Testament. The second problem in the use of the fathers is whether they are actually quoting from the New Testament or whether they are just alluding to it. For example, uh, we have uh, an early church father in the second century who talks about the story of the rich young ruler. Now, everyone who reads the Gospels knows about this story, 
and yet he is never called the rich young ruler in any one of the synoptic gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record the story, but he's not called the rich young ruler in any one of those. And so if a church father is saying the story of the rich young ruler, well, which form is he talking about? Matthew's form, Mark's form, or Luke's form? And uh, is he alluding to the text or is he quoting from it? In Philippians 4.13, for example, Paul says, uh, I can do all things through the one who strengthens me. But an early church father alludes to that reference, or maybe he's quoting from the text, and he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, the addition of Christ is found in some later manuscripts. Is this church father uh, following that text form, even though he predates those manuscripts? Or is he just interpreting this text or just alluding to it? And for him, the one who strengthens him is in fact Christ. Those are some of the difficulties we have. Are they quoting directly from the text or are they alluding to the text? A third problem with the church fathers has to do with the source that they're actually quoting. And this especially is a difficulty when it comes to them quoting from the uh, synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. When they say, as our Lord said, and then they quote what Jesus said, is the form of it what comes out of Matthew or Mark or Luke? And the problem is that we'll have manuscripts that will give it as the form of what the Lord said in Matthew, or other manuscripts that give that as the form of what Jesus said in Mark's gospel. And so is he quoting from this group of manuscripts in Mark or this group in Matthew? If he doesn't say as is written in Matthew or as is written in Mark, then we have some difficulties in trying to determine exactly what he is quoting from. The final problem with the use of the church fathers is that there are times when a particular father is going to quote from the New Testament uh, from the same passage more than once and the difficulty comes when he quotes it in different forms. Sometimes he may quote from it three or four times. Each time is a little bit different. So which text did he follow? Was he being sloppy in his quotations? Did he use a different manuscript each time? Or is he just alluding to the text? Is it from memory? Or is it from copying out a manuscript in front of him? Those are complex issues that are not exactly easy to resolve. However, the lengthier the passage that the father quotes from, the more likely it is that he is copying out the text that is in front of him, and consequently we have a greater degree of certainty that he is actually quoting from that text of the New Testament rather than doing so from memory or alluding to the passage. Well, to sum up, there are certain values to the Church Fathers that are extremely important, but there are also problems with the use of the Church Fathers. And on a sliding scale, scholars have come up with uh, a view that says Here's the way we can tell whether this church father is really quoting from this text or not. And there's levels of certainty that we can have about it. The fathers therefore become extremely important for the text of the New Testament, for us to get into the window of what that original text must have looked like. But there are going to be difficulties along the way, and sometimes it's just too difficult to use the quotations of a church father to establish much of anything about the wording of the original text.